Uh, you are mute. If you are speaking, you are mute. Parmita, you have kept yourself mute. Neil, you are on mute. We are unable to hear you. Your mic is on mute. No, no, no. No, you can hear me? Yeah, 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 now we can hear you. Yeah. So, let's share. Give me a second. You can hear us now, right? Yeah, I can hear us. Right, right. Now we can hear you. Whatever you spoke, we could not hear, Parmita. You can repeat it. Let's say really fast. Okay. I mean, uh, I just welcomed everybody. Uh, in this great event, uh, we have Holly Lambert, Deputy Director of Great Bayery from Australia. Um, and uh, I was making an analogy um, with, with uh, the perception we have in the United States, how big is the Great Bayery Reef? Uh, it's half the size of Texas and twice the size of Florida. And uh, we know like all the reefs in all, of, all the oceans in the world, even in India, it's in critical condition with the increase in the ocean acidification. So um, uh, Holly Lambert is going to talk about that and also what government of Australia is doing to mitigate the situation. We have our department chairperson, uh, Dr. Neil Phillip. He's going to uh, talk a few words and then we have our vice presidents and we have our provost actually with us, Lester Sanders Rapallo. Um, Dr. Rapallo is going to give the welcome speech we have uh, VP Bonergan, VP Delgado, and VP Ginsburg uh, with us. Thank you, Professor San. Again, I just want to welcome everybody in the room again one more time. Also, the folks at all of great friends in India who we just came back. We visited them a couple of weeks ago. Again, Dr. Tanda and everybody else, welcome to this event. Again, we've been connected to Australia for a long time, since 2012. And we have been there. We have had several reciprocal visits. In fact, Holly's boss, I, we owe him some sausage from out of Avenue. He said, Neil, you got to bring some sausage in that, that store on in the <laughs> avenue. So we're going to give some of that to you, Holly, to take back the thread. But, you know, we have a lot of great synergy with Australia. And we, we had a big event in June 2020, you know, had the pandemic. They reached out to us and said, listen, we need to give you some STEM. Uh, we didn't have, we had no lab activities going on. So they called us and we had a big STEM event on a, a virtual webinar where we can, they had a diver in the Barrier Reef. And our students can talk to the diver, you know, live from here in, in New York City. And all over India, we had students from India logged on as well. So we have a great uh, synergy with Bio Reef, and we, we welcome Mrs. Holly Lambert here today to come and continue this, uh, this synergy that we have with the Great Bio Reef in Australia. And I'd like to pass it back on to, I'd like to, again, welcome, give it back to Professor Sen, and she's going to pass it on to Provost Rapolo. So thank you for being here today, guys. Bye. Now, um, I'd like to invite uh, Provost Dr. Rapallo to give his welcome speech. Oh, 
Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Great. What's the energy? So good? You're doing great today? Perfect. So for me, it's an honor, honestly, um, to be here with each and every one of you. And on behalf of our campus president, Thomas Ekenegbi, our fearless leader, we want to welcome our, gay, our guest speaker, Holly Lambert. Um, this is a, a a seminar that Professor uh, Paramita Sen and Dr. Neil put together, but to his remarks, this goes back to 2013. Uh, and I'm just lucky enough to, to take the, the benefits, right? Collectively to be here today, but it's all their work, their hard work, their dedication, uh, their resilience. And I remember in 2019, 2020, uh, VP Irene Delgado, um, Dr. Neil Paramita and, and Holly Lambert, we, we connected via Zoom, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, VP uh, Ginsburg as well. And uh, it was such a therapeutic environment for us because we were able to explore the, the deep, beautiful uh, ocean of Australia. And uh, I wanna say thank you, Holly, for your dedication, for being here with us today. It's truly an honor. Uh, I know you travel thousands of miles to be here with us. So for us, it's, it's an honor. But let me just give you a, a brief synopsis because her resume is very lengthy uh, of uh, Dr. Holly Lambert. Uh, she's the assistant director of the uh, Reef Education with the Greater Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority uh, based in Townsville, Queensland, Australia. Uh, Holly is presenting an introduction to the Great Barrier Reef, managing the marine park and war heritage area. Key threats facing the reef and building reef resilience through stewardship actions. This is an opportunity to learn about one of the natural wonders uh, of the world and how Australia is working to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Holly studied at James Cook University in Townsville and has a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology and a secondary teaching degree. She worked in the public aquarium. Um, that was really fun. Um, and uh, aquaculture industry before becoming a teacher in teaching marine science uh, and outdoor education. In her current role, she combines both passions, leading the Great Berry Reef Marine Park Authorities education programs and initiatives, uh, including Reef Guardian Schools, International Reefs through virtual connections, formal education programs at Reef HQ Aquarium, and engaging with the community through citizen science and STEAM. Uh, base events. It's truly an honor, uh, Holly, to have you here today. And I encourage all BCC students, faculty, and staff that are here with us to please, let's give her a nice warm applause to our special speaker. Thank you. 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 Thank you, everyone, for having me. And uh... Hi, India. Um, I'm really excited. I've, I've come out to New York before in 2019. I'm really excited to come back and uh, was jumped at the opportunity to come and talk to you all while in person, which is exciting after not being able to travel for a few years. So I am, um, yeah, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And um, so, yeah, I work for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, which is uh, an Australian government agency. We sort of sit uh, alongside our Department of Environment. Um, and we're a, we're a federal government agency that looks after the reef, but we also work in partnership uh, with our state government and as well as our 29 odd uh, local government areas that uh, sort of like our county and city councils that are uh, across the entire reef. Um, but first, I'd like to just acknowledge the traditional owners. There's um, 70 traditional owner groups along the breadth of the Great Barrier Reef that are still very much connected to country. They've, they've been living there for 60,000 odd years and are very still very connected with their land and sea country. And just acknowledging the First Nations peoples around the world um, like we said, the Great Barrier Reef extends uh, from about Bundaberg, which is about halfway up the Queensland coast, uh, all the way to the very top of the eastern side of Australia. It's about the size of um, 
Japan or Italy, or like we said before, half the size of Texas or double the size of Florida. So it's about 1,430 miles long. Uh, at its widest, reaches 155 miles wide and 132,800 miles squared. To, I had to convert it all from kilometers today. So that was a little math problem I had to work out. But uh, yeah, like uh, we like to say, it's about 68 million football fields big. So it's uh, quite, quite, a, quite a big size that we look after. Uh, and it's all, it's listed under UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. And it's one of the few natural sites that actually have all meets the characteristics of all four criteria for being a uh, World Heritage Natural Area. And this, um, it's one of, the, one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. So there's lots of different species of animals, crustaceans, small corals, which is probably what we're most famous for. And um, so lots of different species live there and, and it's that diversity and the abundance of those animals up and down the coast that uh, really does make it a wonderful place. Uh, the marine park itself isn't just made up of coral reefs. We all tend to, I don't know how many of you think about the corals and the pretty coral photos. That one? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the marine park that we actually manage isn't just made up of coral reefs. So there's lots of other ecosystems that are really important that will come under what we look after. And so it's um, one of those diverse places as well that's made up of um, mangroves, uh, sandy coral caves, as well as continental islands seagrass, algae and sponge beds, and lots of different communities. So these, um, these ecosystems are what support the, all the different life. So it's not just the coral on the coral reefs, but all of these. So um, we see about 54% of the world's mangroves are found in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park as well. So we see lots of other really beautiful ecosystems that are unique. Um, so one of the things that's really important in a big marine park is that how connected all of the ecosystems are. So uh, right from the land, those mangroves and those coastal ecosystems, right out to the reefs, the islands, all of those communities are connected. And so um, uh, lots of our species um, actually play on this interconnected ecosystem. So uh, our red emperors are a, a nice, big, beautiful reef fish that we have. They live out, out on the coral reefs. They, they spawn out on the coral reefs. The larvae grow up out on the reefs. Then they come in towards the mangroves and they become juveniles in the mangrove systems before sort of growing up and moving out back out to the reef. So that big cycle We've got our barramundi, which is another big, it's a nice fishing species that everyone likes to go fishing for. It's like a big meat along fish. Um, and they do the opposite. So they live in the, in the river systems as adults. They come out to the reef to breed and they go back. So there's really interconnected systems. So inside the marine park, we are, a, uh, it's, as the Australian government agency, we actually manage all the activities that go on in the marine park. Not so much my team, but there are the teams at our agency that do it. And so we look after all the different types of user groups. So from industry, ports, shipping, they all have really tight uh, legislative requirements for how they move through the marine park. It's probably one of the most heavily protected uh, bits of ocean. And so all the boats have AIS trackers, so we know where they are, so that big ships don't run into the reef and do damage. Uh, we've got our commercial use like tourism, uh, fishing, uh, aquarium species take. Those sorts of activities are all really heavily regulated on how many fish they can take, how big they are, when they can do it. We have seasonal closures. We work quite closely with the Department of Fisheries. 
on those things. And then we've got our recreational use, which is the uh, the fun stuff that everyone likes to go there for. So swimming and snorkeling and diving, fishing, those sorts of activities, and as well as our traditional owner use. So there's still a lot of traditional hunting practice and uh, traditional use in the marine park. And so we work with our traditional owners to make sure that that's done sustainably and that all of these people are uh, respecting each other in their different areas. So uh, pre-COVID, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the figure is now, but pre-COVID, the, the Great Barrier Reef added about 6.4 billion Australian dollars to the Australian economy through all the different industries. So it's a very important component of being Australian where a lot of people think about the reef and identify that as one of our key and so this sort of brings me to what we're talking about today, some of the threats that are facing the, the reef. So in, You just put it up, I don't need to do it. That's up here, that's up has anyone been to Australia? Sharks in the on the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, we've got uh, some of the most diverse species. I was actually diving. Um, I went and on a yeah. dive trip in the middle of the year right. uh, to see the minke whales, which, which are the smallest whales in the world that uh, come up to the Great Barrier Reef to breed. Um, and we saw like greater hammerheads and reef dip sharks. There's, there's lots of sharks, uh, tiger sharks. We don't really get great whites that far north, but um, we do get uh, lots of other reef species that are kind of cool. Okay, so, uh, sorry, can everyone see now? Yeah, all good. So, all good. Uh, so yes, every uh, four years, our science team at the Great Barrier Reef produces uh, an outlook report. Uh, we compile all of the science from the Australian Institute of Marine Science, from the universities that are doing study, as well as other researchers. That all gets compiled into one big report. It's about this big every four years. And we put out uh, the report about different aspects about the reef and how healthy it is and what its long-term trends are looking like. Um, the, the, the threats that mainly, the um, threats, so every four years, so the four main threats that we put out that we talk about facing the Great Barrier Reef is uh, coastal development, so modifying coastal habitat, the land-based runoff, which is uh, nutrients and sediment, which is primarily from farming and urban, then direct use, so impacts from direct use, uh, primarily is uh, the historical illegal fishing and poaching, as well as the accidental bycatch of species like turtles and dolphins and some of those other things with fishing, and the crown of thorns, which is a big starfish that eats coral. So they're our sort of main direct use, but we also talk about um, impacts from like plastics, pollution, marine debris, um, 
anchor dropping, all those sorts of things are, are all in that category around direct use. And of course, the greatest threat facing the reef at the moment is climate change. Uh, under climate change, we talk about this increase in severe weather, um, all our cyclones or hurricanes, they spin the other way down there, but our cyclones, we're seeing more intense and more frequent cyclones hitting the coast. We've got increased sea temperatures. So as the air temperature rises, we also see warming of the sea temperature, which is a big component of why coral bleaches. We're seeing sea level rise across the Pacific and Australia. So that's a big threat to the reef is that water increase and as well as ocean acidification. So they're sort of those, those couple of big threats that are facing the reef. Um, I was gonna ask a question, but I've answered it already. So, yeah, so climate change, uh, we have a position statement. So um, uh, climate change being the greatest threat to the Great Barrier Reef and the strongest, fastest possible actions to decrease global greenhouse gas emissions will reduce the risk and limit the impacts of climate change on the reef. Further impacts can be minimized by limiting global temperature increase and to the maximum extent possible, fast track actions that build reef resilience. So it's really important those aspects around uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission globally uh, is, is really one of the strongest actions. And so everyone in the world can contribute to that. Even here, I was lucky enough to go upstairs on the roof and see some of the air quality monitoring systems up there. And so it's really good that um, globally, we're starting to see more of a trend towards reducing these impacts. So. Um, with increased carbon in the atmosphere, we see this ocean acidification, get my word there, ocean acidification, which is actually um, suggesting that it's dropped the pH of the seawater from about 8.1, uh, 8.2 to down to about 8.1. One of the biggest impacts that comes from ocean acidification is it stops corals and crustaceans being able to produce their calcium carbonate exoskeletons. So the corals, the skeletons that they build uh, basically become fragile and weak. They, they sort of crack. And so what that means, they've, they've, it's sort of then the cumulative impacts from like weather. So it means that if they're weaker in their structure, when the weather hits them, they're more likely to break, crash, crumble, which is seeing those reductions in those, those sort of really corals that take a long time to grow. So it's the, we talk about cumulative impact really being our, our biggest threat on the reef. So the um, so it's not just you know any one thing being an issue, it's all of these things. I suppose it's um, a great analogy is when you're sick and you know you, you stub your toe and then you get a little bit of a cough and then your ear hurts and the next thing and suddenly you're really, really, really sick. So the reef's a little bit like that. It's still in a position where it's quite resilient and can recover, but it's the cumulative impacts from all of these things that's really impacting overall on the health. Uh, we're seeing some data come out from the scientists and I, I don't know if anyone, if I don't know if it makes this part of the world. I know we recently did some media coverage over to the US uh, that they're seeing increases in the percentage of coral cover. So the studies from the Australian Institute of Marine Science has just come out that said that coral covers jumped back up to like 30 to 36% across the reef, which is an increase from what it was. But the, the challenge with those that sort of data is that it's not the same species that were there before. So we're actually still seeing a decline in the abundance and the diversity of the corals that make up the building blocks of the reef. So although it is, it's still in a position to be able to recover, we're still seeing the resilient corals that are really tolerant to temperature and uh, different species are tolerant to the, the change in pH, the change in water temperature. 
they're starting to do a lot of research on seeing whether species of corals can be shifted or whether they can be crossbred and whether that will build resilience in species. So uh, our, and there's a really cool project going on. The Australian Institute of Marine Science is working with traditional owners from across the reef to co collect coral samples, uh, crossbreed them and to see whether they can make more resilient species to try and help build the resilience of the corals that are at the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef that seem to be more tolerant to water temperature, light, uh, pH, and see whether they can try and help save some of the northern corals that are seeing that hot water, the more cyclone damage. Um, so the way we build resilience or manage the marine park is we have uh, marine park zoning. So I think to date we've still got the largest percentage of uh, green zones, which is like our national park. So basically the, the colours of the zones lay over the maps. And um, if we start from blue, that's like the least regulated. So uh, basically all the activities, so down this list are all the activities that you can do in the marine parks. It's got like aquaculture, bait netting, diving, collecting, commercial, fishing, crabbing, harvesting, line fishing, research. So all of those different activities down the side, basically as they move across the colors, they get more restricted in what you can do. So in the two blue zones, basically every activity can go on. Uh, so commercial fishing, and then as you move across and hit the yellow, basically a lot of the commercial activities stop. It becomes like our recreational zone. So you can still recreationally fish, but we limit the number of fishing, fishing lines you can have and how many fish you can take. And then we move into our really, into our high preservation zones, which is our orange, green, and pink zones. They really limit the types of activities. So orange is our science zone. So that's where, a lot of activities really only our scientists and researchers can go in there with permits. Our marine park or our green zone, um, basically it's you can go there and you can enjoy it, but you can't take anything. So there's no fishing, um, no commercial activities, but basically you can still go in there and enjoy it. It's like going into a national park on land. And then our pink zone is basically a no-go zone. So we've got these pockets of pink areas that they protected um, back in 2003, well, back in the 70s, that basically no one, no humans have been there until a scientist goes there every now and again. They kind of use them like our control site, I suppose, as a big science experiment, what would happen if no humans came to this reef. And so there's a handful of them up and down the coast that the only time someone's allowed there is when a scientist goes to do some of those really unique, and not all scientists can go there. It's a, They're really locked down on who can go there. And so we work to really build that resilience in the ecosystems and we're sort of still trying to build diversity, make sure all the processes that are occurring uh, are happening healthily and that there's still, while there's still time for recovery. So that's, I suppose, the message of hope is that the reef is not dead. Uh, we, it is still very much alive. It is still wonderful, but it is changing and and that as we lose that diversity and the abundance of the species, um, it is really important that we still have time now to see recovery. Um, this is just a small snapshot that sort of shows the benefits of our green zone. So we see what's called a spillover effect. So by locking in those areas uh, into green zones and preventing a lot of activities there, it means that the fish, the species living there, are really healthy and once sort of that area reaches a carrying capacity, the fish and the animals will move to other reefs and so you see a spillover outside of that green zone into other zones. Uh, so there's some really cool research done on coral trout, which is a really big nice prize fish uh, for fishing to eat. Um, and you can see that those juvenile coral trouts are spilling over onto neighbouring coral reefs. So even though a lot of the recreational and commercial fishermen got upset back in 2003 when we increased the number of green zones, they start they still see the benefit of it over time as those fish are spilling over into other areas. 
And we also see that reefs in green zones are much more resilient to those impacts. So they see lower numbers of corals with disease. There's less crown of thorns, starfish outbreaks. So um, the, the crown of thorns starfish is one of those, uh, our, a lot of our ranges in the marine park um, have big culling programs. Basically they inject them with like a vinegar um, and or bile salts and that kills the starfish. They used to think if they chopped them up and throw them back, they'd kill them. They're actually just making more starfish. Uh, they can grow from a chunk of them. So they're, and the extreme weather. So the, they, they, we see a much, so even in the, in the green zones, we see after these impacts, these direct impacts, uh, recovery is much faster and better in areas. And some of our other management tools, so alongside the zoning and restricting what activities, we also, our agency is responsible for permits. Uh, so we, anyone that wants to do anything in the marine park needs to apply for a permit. So we have a big permits team that deals with that, uh, looks after tourism, education permits, commercial activities. Uh, and that's so we can monitor where, where things are happening, how much they're happening. We have a range of policy plans and strategies that we work with from a local government right up to the state and federal government. Uh, and one of the big things that my team gets to do, which is really cool, is our stewardship programs. Um, so we get to work with community and students, um, getting everybody uh, hands on in the marine park. I don't know. It's probably a bit hard to read, but this our ranges, our field operations in the. So we're responsible for making sure that we everyone's doing the right thing. So we have rangers that go out, uh, do boat inspections. We work with our indigenous rangers, uh, which are on country doing activities. We have compliance, so uh, we're using planes and drones and satellites now to make sure people are doing the right thing in the right zones uh, and manage everything right down to tourism, um, visitors to the marine park. I get to do some really cool stuff and uh, we get to do the fun stuff and we have a Reef Guardian Schools program that uh, my team looks after. So we've got uh, about 300 schools inside along the coast uh, really excitingly, we've just um, started a partnership with NOAA's Ocean Guardian Schools here in Florida. So uh, we've got schools connecting from Australia and America over similar programs. Uh, our Reef Guardian Council program works with our local government councils. We have, uh, we work with uh, the tourism industry uh, with what we call high standard tourism operators. So we've recognised tourism that goes above and beyond best practice to make sure they're doing the right thing and being sustainable. So we work with that sort of sustainability and we have a master reef guide program where we actually train tourism staff to better deliver better education programs to tourists. Uh, so we get to do cool stuff and go and see the reef and take uh, students and visitors and local schools out to the reef uh, and our eye on the reef program which is our citizen science and our um, science research so that's the methodology there's sort of four layers inside it from what the scientists use right down to what you can do as a citizen science uh, basically monitoring the reef and the reef health So these are the things we suggest when you're there to look after it. Obviously, um, being across the world, you guys have a different role you can play. But, you know, so look, really looking to help reduce litter that washes down to reefs is a really big one. I, um, I, Australia is doing a lot. So the Australian government's just banned single-use plastics. Um, so basically... We don't use, so even during COVID with all the health regulations, we were using like bamboo and other sustainable knives and forks and paper straws rather than going back to plastics. Um, and so obviously that helping reduce what does get out to the reef because 
with the global systems, obviously any land-based plastics, we do see a lot of plastics and rubbish washing in uh, from across Asia. And the biggest one is reducing our carbon footprint, which is our energy consumption and use in cars and vehicles. So because we're all connected and all actions matter. And I might leave it there and throw it open to any questions and happy to take them. Okay. Any questions? So my question is um, on the, the slide that you show the different um, like human activities mm -hmm. on the green side that is non-human. Do you see any difference throughout the years? Yeah, on this one. Sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in the different marine the zones, so um, in the pink zone, so there's only a few of them up and down the coast, but there is a very vast difference in the health diversity and the, the physical impacts you can see on the reefs compared to, say, in blue zones. So they do know the green zones are more heavily monitored because they, the green zones make up about 33% of the park, so they're they're much more prevalent. Uh, but yes, there is, you can definitely see the difference in the health in those areas in comparison to the areas where you can fish and boat and take things. Do you want to see? Good morning, ma'am. Yeah, so the question online, just so everyone can hear, is um, what can we do internationally to help protect the Great Barrier Reef? So I suppose the biggest one is, is around that greenhouse gas and those emissions towards reducing the impacts of climate change. Um, so th that, I suppose, you know, the reef being, you know, it, it, it's a little bit like they talk about coral reefs being like the canary in the coal mine analogy where the coral reefs are re around the world, not just in Australia, like everywhere, like Florida here, your reefs as well, are really feeling the impacts of climate change. And you can start to see it in, um, not so much, I suppose, it's as a direct impact, but when it's how slow they're recovering from impacts that they used to recover quite quickly from. And so, yeah, so the, the biggest one is that, that reduction in CO2 emissions and trying to keep the uh, the global temperature down is uh, unfortunately the big thing. And like we say, uh, climate change itself, it, I mean, the reefs aren't just gonna suddenly die and be nothing. Like there will be something there, like there is still something in areas where there used to be coral reefs. Um, so like Florida, I think used to have really quite abundant coral reefs. It sees a low percentage now. I think it's down at like, zero to five percent depending on where you are so you know it, it, it'll take a long time for the great barrier reef to get there but you know there is still an ecosystem there despite the corals not being there it just won't be the pretty wonderful thing that we see thank you Molly. i was going to ask you can you be able to elaborate what is the difference between natural reef and artificial reef and uh, is artificial reefs are as effective as national reefs? So uh, obviously natural reef is the ecosystem like in the photos. Um, sorry. Um, artificial reefs are where we use uh, different substrate to put substrate for corals to attach themselves to. Um, so they use lots of different things. They tend to use like a, uh, it's, it's kind of like cement, I suppose, um, but they're careful with the types of compounds they use so that they're not leaching chemicals. Um, but basically, so they use different substrate structures to put
put that back in the water so that the corals have something to attach to. Um, they need, uh, corals tend to grow back on surface, back on top of like dead corals. So when the corals uh, are impacted by a cyclone, they sort of crush, that's what makes sand. So that, but they need that sort of harder structure in order for the, the coral polyp to attach and then grow into the coral. Um, corals are kind of like upside down jellyfish when they grow. Um, so yeah, so we're looking at, there's a lot of research being done at the moment and trials for different uh, reef restoration. So um, they, there's different types of things depending on whether it's an entirely an artificial reef, which they basically put like cement structures in. We're looking currently at, um, they're like a, a spider frame, like a steel frame um, that, so once all the sort of the coral has, has, has been impacted by a cyclone or something, they, they sort of attach coral nubs, like break off bits of coral, attach them to the, these steel structures, put the steel structure back over the, which holds the rubble in place and basically let, gives the coral a chance to grow out so that it's not crushed under, under the different colors. We have some questions from India. We want to how answer. much? Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 I'm, I'll make this one. Yeah. So how, how much of your impact is towards your research and best practices are shared with other countries and how much buy-in do you get from other countries? Uh, so the question, um, so we try primarily, I suppose, the, the number one way we do it is uh, through UNESCO, um, so the United Nations environmental, I'm terrible with that acronym, but um, the with the United Nations, all of the countries that have coral reefs are part of a subcommittee called um, ICRI, which is the International Coral Reef Initiative. So all of the countries that have coral reefs are a member of that sort of sub working group. And so we work quite closely uh, with those nations on there. Um, we were the secretariat of it for the last few years. I think it's just shifted. So that's primarily that and through the World Heritage Committee, I suppose, are the, the two ways internationally that Australia is working with other nations. Um, we're working quite closely through, I suppose, the Pacific that are being heavily impacted by rising sea levels um, now with our change of government um, to sort of help in the Pacific as well. So the yeah, so the, the nations work well together through the UN um, is primarily how we do that, as well as through like our local stewardship um, programs with different agencies. Like I work quite closely with some of the NOAA team over here in the States and um, programs like what we do sharing around the world. So we, we do try. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. So how much time? Does it take for rejuvenation of coral reefs and can it recover from bleaching? From India. It's from India. India. Yeah. Yep. So um, so when a coral bleaches, um, so inside the tissue of a coral is Suzanne Pelly. It's got a symbiotic relationship with it, like the algae. Um, when it gets too hot, there's chemicals present, too much fresh water. They're really funny. They they like things a certain way. And and if they and so what happens is that um, the, the algae actually change the chemical processes. So the photosynthesis sort of changes. They actually start producing uh, a toxic compound and the coral goes, nope, you need to get out. And so it actually sort of fills its tissue with salt water and like squeezes all the algae out. And so that's why they, uh, that's what's called coral bleaching because the algae is what gives the coral its color. So then what you're looking at is uh, trans translucent tissue and the reason they look white is because you're looking through to the calcium carbonate structure it can actually recover from bleaching inside depending on the corals a, a week up to about a month if the conditions get better it can reabsorb algae back out of the water column and recover um, if it doesn't recover inside that sort of week to a month that's when you start seeing mortality and that's when the coral actually starts to die the tissue so and so then you end up looking just at the the exit the skeleton is what's left and then that 
without the tissue on it, it then crumbles and makes sand or makes rock again back in the. Um, that was. Uh, okay, we have a lot of questions actually <laughs> from India. Um, so uh, that was from Ashwit, and then we have Dr. Kaka Vipure. Madam, I'd like to know about. Most threatened species, and is there any new or invasive species appearing due to climate change? Um, so the uh, the most threatened species. That's an interesting question. There's um, probably a significant impact uh, on the abundance and diversity in certain areas. I think primarily um, most species themselves seem to be okay at the moment with climate change obviously species that have a temperature dependent component like turtles that um so turtles depending on the temperature um will change whether they have male or female eggs uh offspring uh, so it changes which there's there's quite a number of species that have sex determination with temperature um so obviously with climate change, things like that are going to be impacted. So we are seeing a decline long-term in, in species like turtles. Um, in terms of, uh, the second part of that question are the invasive species. So primarily we see a lot of invasive species are brought in with shipping. Um, so things like zebra mussels um, can come in with ballast water on ships. And so we tend to try and get international shipping to change their ballast water out in international waters before they come into the coral reefs to try and prevent a lot of that invasive species. Uh, Crown of thorns starfish is probably the big one that you might see. They're actually a native species, but it's just when they get into uh, outbreak proportions that they become a problem. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. I just had a quick question. So with sea level rise, can you explain a little bit how that might be damaging to coral? Because some of the people might think that well, if there's more water, that you might be more coral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, with sea level rise, um, so corals are predominantly found in the higher levels towards the surface because of how light dependent they are, um, because the algae and their tissue photosynthesizes. Um, so obviously, as you increase depth, you're going to increase light um, with the depth. So the species that are predominantly those really shallow water ones are now obviously deeper so that they're you know the the that light dependency is what's impacted as the water depth increases you also see um changes into areas like in that coastal so as the water increases we're seeing bigger and bigger tides washing coastal so you see that uh erosion off the mainland out you also see um areas that wouldn't you know that um would have been out of the water are now being submerged. And so the, those challenges of changing into tidal areas. So as the intertidal area creeps away and um, the corals find themselves deeper. So, but primarily that would be, you know, that coastal impact on those ecosystems like mangroves and those intertidal zones are probably more impacted by that. Any questions? Any more questions, please? Anybody from that side? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is: Do you have all of this like transportation? Yeah. Yeah. And then another question is like, um. Yeah. Yeah. So there's um lots of coral reefs um. I believe the UNESCO, like the International Coral Reefs, I think uh, some of your reefs in America were listed as endangered uh, through the World Heritage uh, Committee, uh, which, which sees from the UN pressure for the government to take greater action to protect those areas. I think some of the Florida Key reefs 
uh, and some over in California. So I believe I'm, I'm, I am stretching my thing. North Carolina. North Carolina. So there are plenty of reefs around. Um, we So Australia at the moment is, um, I, I think we're actually waiting on a report from the World Heritage Committee. Uh, we were... There was a push uh, internationally to list the Great Barrier Reef as endangered, um, which, which sort of forces the government to take more actions. They came out last year and, and did some, some surveys. So we're sort of waiting for their report to see what will happen. Um, you know, I think if the Great Barrier Reef gets listed as endangered, I think it would be a very, it wouldn't be too long, and I imagine most of the world's international reefs may get listed as endangered following. So, you know, it is still one of the healthier systems. There are some other healthy ones around the world, but there certainly are coral reefs in a lot worse condition um, around the world. So, yeah. I haven't had his hand up for a while. Um, hi, James. I wanted to ask, um, how did you get into marine biology? Is this something you always wanted to do or along the way did you change paths? Uh, I was four. <laughs> uh, we went on a family holiday in Western Australia, which is on the other coast, uh, up to a place called Monkey Mile. And um, we went to a dolphin... Uh, the dolphins are in the wild there and we went to sort of an afternoon talk and I think it was about four and I was mom, my mom they retell the story that I was straight in the water with these dolphins like alongside the marine biologist that was there giving the talk she was in about knee deep in water I was about neck deep in water and I was like getting in there helping her feed the feed the dolphins all over the you know that they, they sort of talked that the dolphins hung around for hours while I was there so and I remember asking that that lady, I was like, what do you do? And she's like, I'm a marine biologist. I was like, well, that's what I want to be. So I pretty much was that big when I decided. Uh, I was given my scuba diving ticket for my 15th birthday. I've worked, spent my life out on the water. So I 100% have always loved being in and around the water. Um, I probably tacked a little bit uh, into education rather than into, so I, I if you're a professor, block your ears. He did doing research and data and writing reports. Not my first day. Love teaching, love learning, writing stuff. Um, so I, I was a, uh, I was a hundred percent. I went to uni. I had I was involved in everything. I was a research assistant. Took every opportunity. But I was a hundred percent a student. Where a where a path. P's get degrees was my saying. So. Uh, I, I was not a I was not a great university student, but I was involved in everything. Um, helped a lot of my professors with research, which probably got me through. But um, realized I was I was not academic at all. Um, didn't had no desire to do research. I tried it for a little bit, uh, but loved talking to people. Loved sharing what I do with people, and realized that that science communication education was more where I wanted to be. So I sort of tacked off into education a little bit uh, and then sort of have brought the two back together with what I do now. So uh, we will wrap up. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, yes. We'll uh, wrap up today. Um, thank you very much for coming over, uh, showing your presence. It's all positive energy. I uh, had two uh, catchy words. One was greenhouse gas emission and plastic in the ocean. Uh, just to let you know that we have a Picaro instrument. Um, we got it, um, I know Dr. Philip got it through a grant. Uh, it is a $50,000 instrument, one computer, which monitors greenhouse gas of methane, carbon dioxide, and water vapor continuously for um, you know 24 hours. And we see amazing results. Uh, today morning, I took a uh, Holly Lombard upstairs. We saw that for about one hour, the carbon dioxide level was 560. That was during the traffic hours. So we see a diurnal range and also seasonal change in the carbon dioxide level. So these are the things we have to think over, um, like what is you know making this global warming or how we can, as a, you know, as a part of citizen science, we can contribute for the betterment. Uh, but thank you for showing the positive energy coming back here. 
um, you know, through the campus and also through these events, we'll have many of them. I will now ask uh, Ruthie Ginsburg, Ruthie um, Bonner Gans is here uh, to say a few words. We are missing Ali Bilda, I think, here. And we have Ruthie Taylor. So if uh, we can have some words from them. Said, uh, it's not my area of uh, expertise, uh, so I would need to learn about it. I do have a fish tank, uh, <laughs> not salt water, but um, maybe what is uh, picked up a few pointers and maybe I'll ask some questions in terms of how, can I, how I can keep my fish alive uh, with this uh, whole thing about uh, environmental change and so forth. So thank you for the presentation, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky uh, Taylor. Yeah. I came in at the very tail end, but I was very happy to hear your story. As someone coming from an island myself, I enjoy the water, I enjoy the coral reef, and to know that we're doing all of these things in order to preserve what God has given us and try to keep it for generations to come. So uh, I think this is very important for all of us who are learning and interested to know that we are all one holistic group, holistic planet, everything feeds off of everything else. So we got to keep it right. Thank you, thank you, Shana. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, and honestly, uh, this is a dynamic board in here. So for Philip, uh, the students, this is for you. You are the future, you are the present. Anything counts, any collaboration, any small step toward the greatest of good will help us uh, to save this planet. I don't have to give you statistics. You, you heard from uh, the, the person, our speaker today, or the speaker, so Holly, thank you so much for bringing wisdom to the BCC. And thank you for traveling so many hours from this area to come here. So let's give you an answer. Oh, I also want to say thank you to the excellent community back in India. Uh, we have a, a, a small house, but a big heart in, in our community here in India, and Paramita and Dr. Leo Phillips are and great ambassadors to the Indian community here at Bronx Community College and the City University of New York. And Dr. Snell Dundee is going to come here with full white talk. He's online. Oh, thank you so much. We look forward to hosting you here at BCC. And on behalf of our campus president, we welcome you. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, and your collaboration. Welcome, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank I can say everyone again. We want to thank you, Pramika. We want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Snehal. Thank you for organizing. We already appreciate all of you. Pramita, Pramita, come on, say uh, bye to. We have how many people online? So 40 people. So um, Dr. Melatis is there, etc. Et
Dr. Melchins, good morning. He may have signed up already. Okay. Say hello to there, I believe. Good morning. Hi, Dr. Melchins. Listening. I can see Dr. Sirisha here. Dr. Sirisha, yes. That's Ashwood. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Thank Maltes. you. Dr. Uh, Maltes, always good to see you. <laughs> a pleasure. I couldn't miss it. It Thank was you, Dr. the presentation. Thank you, sir. Dr. Snehal, do you have any words to us? Yeah, thank you very much. You allowed all our participants to listen to such a great uh, session today, and I'm sure they were all benefited. And many of them, they questioned also from Mumbai University. I could see a lot of them here. So thank you very much for giving us such a uh, wonderful session here. Yeah. And, and tell Mr. Ra, we miss him as well. We'd like to see, you know, we look forward to seeing him yeah. soon, you know? Sure, sure. Oh, sure. Okay. Today he was very busy, so he could not join. Yes. And we have so Mr. Krishna, but, 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 I can't pronounce the last one. How do you pronounce it? Very good, right? but, 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 from India Tourism, former India Tourism. You want to say hi to India? Hi. Great to see you all. Thank you. Krishna is a great supporter of us. Help us uh, celebrate a Diwali with his company helped us celebrate a Diwali a couple of weeks ago, like a week ago, actually. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Krishna. Thank you. Pleasure indeed to see him also. Yes, yes. And let me show you Frank. Frank, Frank is a technical person behind the scenes, made us all happen. We got to thank Frank. <laughs> when we went back and forth, we just, Yeah, sorry we about crazy. the people. We got it right. So. Yes, he did a good job. Thanks. And my students here, come over here, guys. <laughs> this is my, give me a lot of trouble for years. Iris later. Yes, Iris later. This is Josh. Yeah. This is Josh. Hi, hi, just want to say hi to the students. Hello. Yeah, India. So, hi. yeah. Thank you again. Thank you, Snehal. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good All night. Right. Glad you guys can join. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna sign off now again. Um, this is recording. We can send a recording to you, okay, to everyone. No, it wasn't. It, it's it's it was recorded automatically. Oh, somebody must have signed. Yeah, it, it does automatically. Okay, yeah. Cool. Okay, so we're going to sign off now. We'll see you guys again soon. Um, yes, okay. Take care, everyone from India. Bye-bye.